All right. Okay, take two. All right, so thank you so much um, for joining us, Sunny. It's really great to have you here. Um, because we're recording, can you first share your name, where you are from, and what you do for a living? Sure. So my name is Sunshine Ammerman. My friends call me Sunny. I'm from uh, Connorsville, Indiana, and um, I'm already on disability at the age of 32. So if I had to say something that I do for a living, even though it's not a paid job, um, I consider myself a patient advocate. I help to raise awareness for rare diseases like my own and to help support others uh, that are going through chronic illness, rare diseases, and, you know, invisible disabilities specifically, uh, as they go through a lot of the similar things that we typically experience uh, as a result of living with these things, even though we may have totally different diagnoses. So I host a support group every week, and once a month we get together in VR and watch movies and hang out and build a strong community and just support one another. So that's what I do. That is so cool. And I'm, I'll be really interested to hear more about those, especially that support group as we go along here. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, could you please describe yourself for our blind audience? Sure. So I've got a rare disease called septo-optic dysplasia, which has caused something called optic nerve hypoplasia, um, which basically means the wiring connecting, you know, my optic nerves to, or my optic nerves are underdeveloped. So the wiring from my eyes to my brain is bad. So it's kind of like having a faulty audio or a video wire to your TV. Um, because of that, I'm totally blind in both peripherals and what vision I do have is worse than that of a senior citizen. So I've got poor vision overall. That keeps me from being able to drive, which limits my you know, independence overall. Um, luckily, it doesn't seem to have affected my ability to enjoy XR, so that's great. But I do uh, you know, deal with that partial blindness. All right. Well, that's really helpful too. Thank you for that context. Um, and within that context, um, I'm wondering if you could, you talked a little bit about kind of how this prevents you from driving and, and seeing other things. Um, I'm wondering if you could also walk us through a typical day um, living with your disability. Sure. So um, in a typical day, uh, the things that actually affect me mostly in terms of disability is uh, due to another complication from the septo-optic dysplasia, which is called panhypopituitarism. Basically, my pituitary gland didn't develop properly, so I deal with a lot of debilitating fatigue, muscle weakness, and you know, just my muscles not responding like I would like them to uh, whenever these uh, hormones are out of whack. So I get those flare-ups, and it makes me you know, unable to do basic daily tasks sometimes. Uh, like for instance, today, I'm so tired, <laughs> like physically earlier, I was too exhausted to play video games for a while. I could just, the only thing that I could do was lay in bed and just kind of chat with my friends to keep myself occupied. Um, but on a typical day, um, in terms of uh, my visual impairments, um, I, you know, uh, that comes into play when say I'm walking from the living room to the kitchen and I might misjudge the distance from the countertop to my arm and uh, get a nice bruise on my arm or bump into a door frame, you know, since I'm blind in both peripherals. Uh, my arms are pretty good at taking on bruises these days. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, that's something that's pretty typical in my case. Um, the scariest thing would be if I were to go out into the world and uh, I live in an area that doesn't have a lot of uh, good pedestrian infrastructure. So it's kind of dangerous for me to walk along the side of the road not knowing when a car might come along. I used to have these glasses that would, uh, they were called Chadwick lenses, and they would kind of bring in a little bit of uh, my lost vision on the sides by um, attaching these special lenses that kind of work like side mirrors on a car does. So that would allow me to kind of turn my eye to the left a little bit and kind of see what would have been in my peripherals. Those were fantastic. Unfortunately, my prescription changed and then my insurance refused to cover uh, the cost of those glasses again. They were originally covered by book rehab services when I was trying to find work that I could do. They were like $2,000 glasses. <laughs> Luckily, Voc Rehab covered those for me at that time. I miss those a lot now. Um, but, you know, I just don't have access to that anymore, which stinks. So that's something that really imp um, impacts me day to day in terms of uh, how my disability, you know, impacts my day to day life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that's probably a side conversation sometime too about kind of um, access to healthcare and yes. what that means for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing um, that information. And now I want to transition into um, your experiences with XR. 
Um, and we're thinking about this, and you probably know this too, is sort of a broader term. So um, I know you specifically have experience with VR, so you're welcome to speak to that and other things related to XR that might come to mind as well. So um, can you tell me about a time or times you've experienced XR and what that has been like for you? Sure. So uh, I first got my very first VR headset back in, I think, 2019 when the Quest 2 came out. Or no, sorry, when the uh, the original Oculus Quest came out, um, I decided to go ahead and get one for myself uh, to play Beat Saber because <laughs> it looked like fun. And originally, I didn't know if my eyesight would allow me to enjoy VR because I do have, you know, issues with my vision, you know, being poor overall. So I was afraid, you know, maybe with my depth perception issues that might affect VR and I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. Luckily, that wasn't the case. And I was just hooked right away. I love Beat Saber. I had a blast with it. And uh, then I decided, well, um, let's see, you know, what other free programs I can get on this headset. And that's when I discovered social VR. And that was a game changer for me. Um, like I mentioned, because of my eyesight, I'm my independence is greatly impaired. I'm not allowed to go out on my own as often because I can't drive. Um, so I'm stuck at home a lot. And of course, that leads to a lot of isolation. It's hard for me to socialize that way. I do have wonderful friends that are very kind and come over and take me to places and we have a good time. But you know, it's that's not feasible all the time. So I'm stuck at home a lot. Finding social VR was a wonderful outlet because at any time I could put on that brick, hang out in my living room and be in a party or attend a special event. Uh, one of the first social groups that I joined was actually a weight loss support group uh, on a platform called Altspace, which is now defunct, unfortunately. RIP Altspace, you were my home. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, oh, it's breaking my heart, man, that just hit. <laughs> I miss Altspace so much, it was wonderful. Um, but yeah, just being able to uh, reach out and socialize with other people, even complete strangers in, you know, VR was fantastic. And I discovered that a lot of folks in VR are in the same situation that I'm in. You know, they're also disabled or, you know, have a hard time getting out of the house for whatever reasons, be it social anxiety or whatever. And having access to a social outlet through virtual reality from the comfort of their own homes changed their quality of life dramatically. And I definitely saw that, you know, in my case. Luckily, I got my VR headset before the pandemic hit, uh, hit uh, and that really carried me through COVID because at that time, due to my uh, compromised immune system because of my pituitary disorder, I was at a really high risk of developing COVID. It was bad enough that my partner and I actually like quarantined from each other in our own home. We didn't see each other for like about a year and <laughs> we lived in separate rooms in the same small house because he had to go to work and I, you know, didn't. <laughs> so... Um, I would spend a lot of time in VR, getting that social outlet, breaking that isolation, and then that's when I discovered the community of other folks that have disabilities as well, and then I started to build that support group. So that's that's a place where XR has really touched my life in a really positive way. Um, that and, you know, the games like Beat Saber, uh, Supernatural, which I really, I, I can't really do that anymore because of my cardio issues, we can get into that later, but, um, you know, other games that get you moving and active and, you know, finding movement that feels good within VR is also therapeutic in a way. So that's where VR has really touched me. Now, in terms of augmented reality, I haven't really experienced much of that myself, but I daydream about ways in which AR can really help me. Like um, whenever I go to the grocery store and I'm staring at these aisles of food, like products and stuff that I'm, you know, I'm looking for something, but my eyes have a hard time focusing. Um, it would be amazing to have like an AR program in my glasses or whatever that could help me find the products I'm looking for on the shelf and like identify them, highlight them or something so that I'm not standing there staring for two minutes feeling self-conscious that other people are seeing me staring blankly apparently at this wall of boxes, you know, um, things like that I'm really excited about. But that's, yeah, that's all I've got in terms of VR and uh, AR. Yeah, great. Um, so I'd, this is all really cool um, and I want to hit on a few more things with you. Um, I just really am interested in the social aspect of um, VR and what you found and what other people have found. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that in mind, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about your support group and specifically around VR right now. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, so um, I started the support group as a... Um, just to reach out and see if anybody else would be interested in joining a social group like that on Altspace. So the really great thing about Altspace was um, they made it really easy to create and moderate events. So I started, the first one was like a Q&A thing, asking people how VR has actually helped them in their life. 
in terms of, you know, disability and isolation and stuff like that. And that's how I met a few of the folks that we, you know, that I decided to start building the group around. Um, and then after that event, I had the first official support group event and uh, people came to that. And I've, man, a lot of the people that came to that first event, at least I think there are two or three, at least two that are still in the support group to this day, three years later. It's incredible. <laughs> and we still meet every Sunday. Um, now we're meeting in Discord because alt space is shut down. Um, but during that time, like actually being in the physical <laughs> space in VR, and I'm doing scare quotes here for anybody who might only be listening to the audio. <laughs> um, but, you know, being in that physical place uh, with other people really gave you that sense of presence. And it was wonderful. We're not really getting that in Discord anymore, unfortunately. So I'm hoping to find another platform that we can move to. But at the time, when we were building this support group, that was really important to a lot of us because it, you know, being in a space with other people who understand what you're going through, especially when it comes to a topic as, you know, isolating as disability or chronic illness where you can't really talk about it in the general public because it makes healthy people uncomfortable. Um, it's, it was really wonderful and just a, a really heartwarming outlet for all of us in the group. And I think that's what kept us together so strong and kept us coming back each week. That's great. That is so cool. Have you looked into, uh, you said you're kind of hoping to find a new platform for this group. Have you found any potential options out there? Yeah, we've looked into a few others. Um, for a little while, we tried to meet on a new platform called Spatial. That's S-P-A-T-I-A-L dot I-O is the uh, website for that. Um, they have a lot of potential, but they're very new and there are a lot of bugs on their platform. Uh, we gave them several opportunities. Uh, we tried coming back each week for about a month and a half, we tried. Um, and it's just the bugs were so bad, it was a deal breaker. Uh, the thing that I loved about that the most was that you could access facial from your VR headset or your phone or your tablet or your computer. Having the, the ability to access it from multiple platforms is ideal for our group, especially since a lot of folks, when they're dealing with really severe symptoms, it's hard for them to put on the VR headset because it's physically uncomfortable for them, but they still wanna be a part of the group. Um, so it's really important for us to find a, a platform that can do that. We also talked about um, VR chat. I personally don't care for the culture in VR chat. I think that overall it's a bit toxic. Um, you go into any public room and you'll find a bunch of children screaming racial obscenities to try to seem edgy. It's not great. Um, and even though I know that you can set up, like go to a private room and you know create your own worlds and only invite people to join you, that's not what I'm really looking for for this group. I need to uh, find a platform that will allow our group to grow organically. Like uh, if you were to walk into a, a coffee shop in your town and somebody's hosting a public event, uh, like a, a poetry corner or something where you're invited to come and you know hang out. That's the kind of feel that I want for this group. I don't want it to be a closed garden. So VR chat doesn't seem like a good place for us either, <laughs> even though I lo love the fact that they're expanding uh, and soon they're going to allow people to join uh, not only from the VR headset and the computer, which they have available now, but also through Android devices like a smartphone. Um, they're adding that update soon, which is great. Um, the more they expand, the more I might consider moving us to VR chat, but I would really like to look for a platform that's more like um, alt space used to be. Um, fingers crossed that when they come out with mesh, that, that will be available to the general public. Right now, it looks like they're directing more towards corporate uh, businesses and stuff. So I don't know if you know regular folks like me will be able to have access to it, but that would be ideal. Um, Facebook Horizon or Meta Horizon Worlds is great, but you have to have a Meta Horizon headset to access it. So that is uh, not accessible for everybody in our group either. So that's where we're at in terms of finding another platform to go to. <laughs> Just yeah. what it is for now. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and kind of on that note of like um, Meta Horizon not necessarily being as accessible as it could be for groups, um, you've noted some other things in terms of accessibility um, when it comes to XR and VR specifically. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about um, accessibility features that you have found really important or um, accessibility features that are lacking um, when you come into these spaces and use VR? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first one that comes to mind is uh, real-time subtitles would be amazing. Like closed captions, as I'm speaking, having those words appearing 
you know, in a UI for somebody to read who has, you know, maybe hard of hearing. Uh, that is really important. Um, another thing which may not really seem like an accessibility feature, but it really is, especially for folks, uh, folks who are neurodivergent and uh, deal with a lot of anxiety and might be afraid to speak up when they want to be called on, is a raise hand feature, which Altspace had. So it, you know, I would be able to toggle on this option to raise your hand to be called on because for our uh, support group, uh, what we do is we start with check-ins and introductions. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and do a check-in, you could click on the raise hand button. I would call on you when it's your turn and then you can share as much as you feel comfortable sharing and then move on to the next person. A lot of uh, platforms don't have that raise hand feature. Even Discord doesn't really have that uh, option, which is unfortunate because <laughs> that was so helpful for our group because a lot of folks in my group are neurodivergent along with their chronic illnesses. Uh, so that's really difficult for them because of that anxiety. Um, but honestly, though, for uh, a lot of folks, the thing that I hear about the most is the need for um, the sub or the, the closed captions and real time translations as well, which I know is difficult to do, but it is available, even though it's not perfect. And I wish more platform platforms would implement that uh, because it would allow you know folks from different cultures and language backgrounds to connect as well in these, uh, you know, in these groups. Oh, and the, of course, the option to, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> just things, everything's coming to mind now. Um, I actually have an accessibility, uh, VR accessibility chart uh, for our group uh, that we've been kind of putting together, which um, I'll send you the link to that in the Zoom chat, um, because um, we try to assess games and uh, VR experiences based on their accessibility features. There are a lot on here that come to mind that may be helpful for you. Um, each... Uh, column in the VR accessibility chart there has different things like uh, your ability to uh, interact with the VR space while you're seated, uh, you know, sitting straight up in a fixed position or in a swivel chair or lying back at a 45 degree angle. Um, it would be amazing if all VR um, experiences were accessible while laying down for folks who are bed bound. Um, a lot of these places are not, even social VR. Um, you just you can't. <laughs> I mean, you, you can try, but you're just going to be staring at the ceiling while everybody else is looking face forward like normal. Um, there are so many things that we could add to help folks uh, access these spaces better. Um, but um, one that I really do want to point out is uh, the ability to interact with either one controller or no controllers at all. Uh, I know a lot of amputees in VR, believe it or not, that are amazing fishers in real VR fishing. Um, and, you know, a lot of platforms just don't have that accessibility feature for them. Okay. Yeah. And thanks for this resource. This is really helpful. I'm, I'm actually going to spell it out, um, for our listeners. Um, so it's spoonievr.com slash chart. So S P O O N I E V R.com slash C H A R T. Um, and we'll share that as well. Um, but this looks great. Thank, Thank you. you. No, no problem at all. So you also mentioned um, that you ha you have like AR, for instance, um, you have some dreams about what it could be for you. Um, and I'm wondering with e examples like that in mind, um, what is your vision for XR in the future? Yeah, my vision for XR in the future is to be able to afford like AR glasses or something, you know, passive that's easy to wear. Um, that can help assist me in my day-to-day -day life interacting with the world in general. Like I mentioned earlier, going to the grocery store and having like an overlay point out the products that I'm looking for. I can put in a shopping list before I go to the store and through the app or whatever, and then it will just tell me, oh, I see you're at Kroger now. Would you like me to turn on navigation? All right, yes. Uh, this is the aisle that you need to go to for this product, and here it is on the shelf. So I'm not standing there for two minutes while somebody's staring at me thinking, why is this lady staring at macaroni and cheese for five hours? You know, <laughs> it's it's that's something that really bothers me as somebody that deals with low vision issues, just worrying that other people might think that I'm just zoning out when I'm not. <laughs> um, so little things like that are really helpful. Um, also, like if I'm walking down the street, uh, there could be sensors on the sides of the glasses uh, picking up for the things that I'm missing in my peripherals, like uh, saying, hey, there's a car coming up on your side. It could be like a very gentle like flash of a, a, a light or like a, I don't know, some sort of image indicator letting me know there's a, there's a car coming or even audio indicator. Uh, letting me know, you know, almost like um, like a sonar sound or something, like telling me how close it is, uh, just in case I don't hear the car. My hearing is actually pretty good, so I rely on that a lot of the time 
uh, and you know to to watch out for things like that. But having actual AR support for things like that would be really amazing. And then of course for everyday use for anybody, regardless of levels of ability, um, having you know a, a heads up display telling you how to get to the coffee shop or uh, recommending hiking spots or helping to identify birds that you're checking out while you're you know out enjoying nature, uh, little things like that uh, get me really excited about the future of AR. Um, but accessibility features are the things that really get me going. I just, I can't wait to see where that goes. <laughs> and so you, I think you've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious with this other question of if you had a magic wand um, and can make anything happen, what would you change or make happen for XR? I would make it more accessible financially for folks. I think that right now it's cost prohibitive for a lot of people and they can't really afford it. And I know a lot of folks who are um, like, there's a lady that lives three houses down from me that is alone all the time. She has people that come to, you know, help take care of her like home health aides and stuff, but she's alone. And I just, I know that if she had access to this kind of technology, maybe she wouldn't feel as isolated. Um, I know a lot of folks are kind of, have a hard time learning how to, you know, <laughs> uh, navigate technology, especially the older generations. But if my grandma is any indicator, like she loves VR. I take her on experiences whenever she comes over to visit. And she's like 73 years old. She loves it. I took her into the Anne Frank house and she was just blown away. So I think that if, if folks can really learn how to use the technology and then have it financially available to them, that would change a lot of people's quality of life for the better overall. So I would, if I had that magic wand, I would just make it more affordable and more easily accessible to folks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. One more question. Um, is there anything else you'd like us to know about your experiences with XR before we conclude the interview today? Sure. Um, I think that in terms of, um, you know, the way that I like to express myself as somebody who does live with a disability, um, I think that it would be great to have more representation in VR. Um, I, I don't have a wheelchair, but I know a lot of wheelchair users who do use VR who are really bothered by the fact that they can't have their wheelchair in VR, which may seem really silly to some people. But if you grow up living in a wheelchair, it's a part of your life and it's part of you. Um, even though, you know, you, you don't define yourself by your wheelchair, it's something that's really close to you and you want to be able to bring that with you in VR to represent yourself. Like I like to wear the same kind of clothes that I like to wear day to day on my avatar in VR. I like to represent myself as I am. So if I were a wheelchair user, I would want the option to have the wheelchair with me, you know, and a lot of um, social VR applications just to steer clear from that. I actually remember a conversation that I had with one of the alt space developers back when they were easily accessible um, and you could just chat with them uh, back in the day. It was a long time ago. Uh, and, and I brought up that uh, topic of the wheelchair thing and they said they had actually discussed it with some of their developers and they decided against it because they didn't want to deal with people being discriminated against for having the wheelchairs, which I think is a bad take. But <laughs> uh, I, I just I wanted to bring that up because I think that's something that uh, a lot of uh, especially social VR applications and other XR, you know, folks should keep in mind as they're developing these uh, spaces for us. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a good thought to end on. Um, so thank you so much. We'll stop the recording.